This is the story of a group of Africans who were captured in their homeland and brought in chains to the Americas and who revolted, captured the ship they were on, the Amistad, and eventually were seized off the coast of New England. They won their freedom in a famous court case and ultimately sailed back to their homeland in Africa. The fight for the rights of the Amistad Africans not only gained their freedom, it also helped to build the movement against slavery in the United States. The African struggle and the support they received from black and white Americans are still remembered today, even though it all happened 150 years ago. Much excitement has been created in New York for the past week from the report of several boats having seen a schooner full of Negroes and in such condition as to lead to the suspicion that she was a pirate. The long, low black schooner was the Amistad. A United States ship sighted her near Long Island, New York and captured her. It took prisoner the Africans who were in control of the Amistad released two white Spaniards they were holding and towed the ship to New London, Connecticut. A federal district judge heard one of the Spaniards, Jose Ruiz, give his version of the Amistad story. I bought 49 slaves in Havana, Cuba and shipped them on board the schooner Amistad. Ruiz was accompanied by another Spaniard, Pedro Montes, and four children he had bought as slaves. The Amistad sailed for the Spaniards' plantations in another part of Cuba. But after three days, a rebellion broke out led by Sengbe Pie, whom the Spaniards called by the name Joseph Cinque. In the night, I heard a noise. All of us were asleep except the man at the helm. I saw this man, Joseph Cinque. I took up an oar and I tried to quell the mutiny. I cried, no, no. Ah! Then I heard one of the crew cry, murder. The captives rushed the deck and seized the Spaniards. told me I should not be hurt. They tied our hands. The slaves told us next day they had killed all. Montez and Ruiz were ordered to head the Amistad towards the rising sun back to Africa. But at night, they secretly turned around and headed up the coast of North America. For two months, they sailed losing 10 of the Africans from lack of food and water. Eventually, they made their way to Long Island Sound near Montauk Point. The two Spaniards asked the court to hand over the Amistad to Spanish officials. They also demanded the cargo, and they included as part of the cargo the black men and children they claimed to own as slaves. Slavery goes back to the dawn of human history and has been practiced by peoples in many parts of the world, including both Africa and Europe. Europeans began to explore and trade with Africa around 1450, and slaves became an important part of that trade. As Europeans colonized the Americas, they imported millions of Africans to work as slaves. At the time of our story, two and a half million black people were slaves in the United States. Most were in the South, but slavery was still legal in Connecticut, where a court was deciding the fate of the Amistad captives. After hearing the Spaniards' hair-raising story, Federal District Judge Andrew Judson decided that the African men should be charged with mutiny and murder 
and the children held as witnesses. They were all taken to the New Haven, Connecticut jail to await trial. Most Americans at that time accepted the idea that some people had the right to own others as slaves, but a small vocal movement believed slavery to be a sin against Christianity and a betrayal of the ideals of American democracy. They were called abolitionists because they demanded the immediate abolition of slavery. A Connecticut abolitionist named Dwight Jaynes went to the first court hearing and asked Ruiz about the captives. I inquired if they could speak Spanish. She said no, they were just from Africa. Jaynes immediately contacted abolitionists in other cities about the Amistad. They saw it as a heaven-sent opportunity to call public attention to the evils of slavery. They quickly formed the Amistad Committee and issued an appeal for contributions to hire lawyers for the captives. 38 fellow men from Africa, kidnapped from their native land, transported across the seas and subjected to atrocious cruelties. Three veteran abolitionists led the Amistad Committee. Louis Tappan was a wealthy New York merchant. In 1834, an anti-abolitionist crowd had ransacked his home and burned its furnishings. Joshua Levitt was a lawyer and a congregational minister who edited the abolitionist newspaper, The Emancipator, in New York. He helped found the Liberty Party, a predecessor to today's Republican Party. Simeon Jocelyn was a draftsman who had founded and served as minister to the first black church in New Haven. He had tried to establish a college there for blacks, but it was blocked by anti-abolitionists. The Amistad Committee persuaded Roger Sherman Baldwin, a distinguished lawyer who would later become the governor of Connecticut, to serve as lawyer for the Africans. The captives were taken to Hartford by canal, boat, and stagecoach for an appearance before the United States Circuit Court. Justice Smith Thompson dismissed the charges of murder and mutiny on the grounds that a United States court could not try the captives for a crime alleged to have occurred on a Spanish vessel. But Judge Judson of the District Court refused to release the Africans because they were still claimed as property by Ruiz and Montez. A professor of languages at Yale University named Josiah Willard Gibbs visited the Africans in the New Haven jail. He was determined to use his knowledge of languages to break the communication barrier with the Africans. He held up one finger, and the Africans told him their word for one. E ta. He held up two fingers. Fe le. Then three, sao wa, and four, na ni. na ni. After learning to count from one to ten in the African's language, Professor Gibbs went to the port in New York City, hoping to find someone who could serve as an interpreter for the Africans. He walked up and down the docks, counting out loud until he found James Covey a young African who himself had been captured by slavers, freed, taught English, and employed on a British warship. Professor Gibbs brought Covey to New Haven to see if he could translate for the Africans who were being held in jail. One of the captives coming to the door and finding one who could talk in his own language took hold of him and literally dragged him in. All seemed to be overwhelmed with joy, all talking as fast as possible. Covey made it clear that most of the captives were Mende, a people who live 
in what is now Sierra Leone. With cover to interpret, the Mende were finally able to tell their story. They had been captured in Africa by Africans who sold them to European slave traders. Sinkei was a rice farmer with a wife and three children. He was seized by four men when traveling in the road and his right hand tied to his neck. He was sold to a son of a neighboring king who sold him to a Spaniard. Grabo was married and a planter of rice. He speaks four African languages. He was caught on the road when going to buy clothes. Kali was a small boy. He was stolen in the street. Teme, a young girl, lived with her mother, brother, and sister. A party of men in the night broke into her mother's house and made them prisoners. She never saw her mother or brother again. Hundreds of captives from all over the region were brought to the slave port of Lamboco. Slaves are put into a prison. Two are chained together by the legs. A Portuguese slave trader bought five or six hundred Africans and loaded them onto the slave ship to Cora. On board there was a large number of men, but the women and children were far the most numerous. They were fastened together in couples by the wrists and legs, day and night. The space between decks was four feet. They were obliged, if they attempted to stand, to keep in a crouching posture. If they left any of the rice that was given to them uneaten, they were whipped. Many of the men, women, and children died on the passage. The Africans were brought to Havana in the Spanish colony of Cuba and sold as slaves. Sinke recalled that when the captives were separated in Havana, most of them were in tears. They had come from the same country and were now to be parted forever. Ruiz and Montes bought 53 of the captives and set sail in the Amistad for their plantations in another part of Cuba. Conditions on the Amistad were brutal. The translator recounted Foon's story of the voyage. On board the vessel, he had not enough to eat or drink, only two potatoes and one plantain twice a day, and half a teacup of water morning and evening. He asked for more water and was refused. For stealing water, he was severely flogged. Powder, salt, and rum were applied to his wounds. The marks of his wounds are still to be seen. The captors were told that a terrible fate lay ahead. The cook told us they carry us to some place and kill and eat us. That night, Sinke used a nail to break his padlock, then unchained his companions. They found sugarcane knives and stormed the deck. Sinke killed Cook because Cook said he was going to kill them and eat them. He killed the captain after he killed an African. Before their stories were known, the Amistad Africans had often been portrayed as violent savages. They were hardly above the apes and monkeys of their own Africa. The language they jabber incomprehensible here. Once the Africans were able to tell their stories through their translator, public opinion shifted. They were increasingly seen as victims of oppression who had fought for their freedom. They were portrayed as heroes in paintings, poems, and plays. Students from Yale University began teaching the Mende English and instructing them in Christian religion. It would do your heart and soul good to sit and see them learn. When they come to a hard word, soon as they find out what it is so that they understand it, they will laugh right out loud. 
It makes them so glad. Those who have been with them have not unfrequently seen the tear start at the mention of the aged father or the defenseless wife and child. And stout men turn aside and weep. And the little children cry as if their hearts would break. Asked if they wanted to return to Africa, one of the captives replied, Tell the American people that we very, very much want to go to our home. After months of delay, the Amistad case finally came to trial in New Haven. The abolitionists had good reason to fear the outcome of this trial. The judge was Andrew Judson, who had instigated a law against schools for blacks in Connecticut, and then prosecuted a young white school teacher, Prudence Crandall, for admitting black girls to her school in Canterbury, Connecticut. Lawyers for the President of the United States, Martin Van Buren, strove to keep the courts from letting the Africans go free. President Van Buren had no strong views on slavery, but needed votes from slaveholders in the South to win re-election. The president had a ship waiting in the New Haven Harbor to carry the Africans back to Cuba an almost certain death should they lose their case. Hundreds of spectators crowded the trial, which lasted a week. Representatives for Spain demanded that the United States return the Amistad and its cargo. The Spaniards cited a treaty between Spain and the United States. All ships and merchandise which shall be rescued out of the hands of any pirates or robbers on the high seas shall be taken care of and restored entire. Spain's lawyers argued that the black prisoners were merchandise that should be returned along with the ship. They pointed out that slavery was legal in Cuba and that the Amistad's papers showed that the blacks were legally the property of Ruiz and Montes. Lawyers for the Africans answered that while slavery might be legal in Cuba, the slave trade between Africa and the Americas had been outlawed by a treaty between Spain and Great Britain. The papers saying the Africans were legal slaves of Ruiz and Montes falsely stated they had long been slaves in Cuba. They are natives of Africa and were born free and ever since have been and still of right are and ought to be free and not slaves. The Mende were familiar with court proceedings because Mende society had a legal system of its own. Through their interpreter, they told their story to the court. To the surprise and relief of the abolitionists, Judge Judson held that the Africans were neither slaves nor Spanish subjects. They were therefore free by the law of Spain itself. Cinque and Grabo shall not sigh for Africa in vain. Bloody as may be their hands, they shall yet embrace their kindred. But the United States government appealed the decision to the Supreme Court. The abolitionists persuaded a former president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, to help argue their case before the Supreme Court. Carl Lee, 11 years old and an outstanding student, wrote to him in English. Dear friend, Mr. Adams, I, I want, want to, to write, write a, a letter, letter to you, you because you love Mendy people and you talk to the great court. We want you to ask the court what we have done wrong. What foreign Americans keep us in prison? Dear friend, Mr. Adams, you have children, you have friends, you love them. You feel very sorry if many people come and carry them all to Africa. We feel bad for our friends 
and our friends all feel bad for us. We want you to tell court that many people no want to go back to Havana. We no want to be killed. All we want is make us free. Before the Supreme Court, John Quincy Adams, known as Old Man Eloquent, condemned the role played by United States government officials as an immense array of power exerted on the side of injustice. Have the officers of the U.S. Navy a right to seize men by force, to fire at them, to overpower them, to disarm them, to put them on board of a vessel and carry them by force and against their will to another state without warrant or form of law. The Supreme Court ruled that the Africans were entitled to their liberty like any other free-born human beings and should be free to go wherever they wish. The court said they had exercised an ultimate right. The ultimate right of all human beings in extreme cases to resist oppression and to apply force against ruinous injustice. The decision gave heart to abolitionists, both black and white. A New York abolitionist meeting declared, The decision by which the Amistad captives were liberated has a powerful influence on the question of human rights, not only in this country, but throughout the world. We can behold the faint glimmering of a more auspicious morn when the judges of our land will declare that property in man cannot be held. The Mende greeted the news of the Supreme Court's decision with joy. In a Bible presented to John Quincy Adams, they wrote, Most respected sir, the Mende people give you thanks for all your kindness to them. They will never forget your defense of their rights before the great court at Washington. They feel that they owe to you, in large measure, their deliverance from the Spaniards and from slavery or death. Free at last, the Mende moved to Farmington, Connecticut, where living quarters were built for them on Main Street by abolitionist supporter Austin Williams. It was nearly two years since they had first been kidnapped. They were ready to go home. Thousands contributed to help them return to Africa. Many of the supporters hoped the Mende would help set up a Christian mission in their country. James Pennington, pastor of the first colored congregational church in Hartford, was himself an escaped slave. I love the Mendians. I love their country. I purpose to cooperate in fitting out a mission in every possible way and also to give my prayers and labors to its support. Pennington helped form the Union Missionary Society, the first such organization which refused to accept money from slaveholders. Together with the Amistad Committee, it organized dozens of meetings to raise money to send the Mende back to their homeland. The Africans read from the New Testament, by which they showed the success with which they had mastered our language, as well as the proficiency they had made in learning to read. They sung two hymns in English with great melody and harmony, and sung also two of their native songs. Kinna made an address in English, giving the history of their captivity. Nearly a year after the Supreme Court's decision, they had raised enough money to hire a ship for the 35 surviving Africans and five missionaries. As they reached the coast of Sierra Leone, Sinke wrote Louis Tappan of the Amistad Committee. I thank all American people for the same Mendy people home. I shall never forget American people, your friend, Sinke. Some of the Mende returned to their home villages, 
Others remained at the mission. Many of the future leaders of Sierra Leone were educated at schools established by the Mende Mission in Africa. Sarah Malgru, one of the children from the Amistad, went to Oberlin College in Ohio and then went back home to Africa to teach at the Mende Mission. In the United States, the Amistad Committee, which had fought for the Africans' freedom, joined with other groups to form the American Missionary Association. It became the largest abolitionist organization in the country, founding hundreds of schools for freed slaves in the South and many of the historically black colleges. The Race Relations Institute, it set up at Fisk University, trained many of the civil rights leaders of the 1960s. The Amistad struggle represented an important step in the effort to abolish slavery. It provided an issue that united the often divided abolitionist movement. It focused public attention on the conflicts between slavery and widely held religious and political beliefs. And it showed the capacity for heroism of those who might be enslaved. The legal decision in the Amistad case did not challenge slavery itself. But for the first time, the United States Supreme Court asserted that people of color had the same rights as anybody else and that the courts were bound to respect those rights. It would be many years, however, before the United States would actually begin to respect the rights of people of color. Indeed, 16 years after the Amistad decision, the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case declared that a Negro had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. They were not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. Only in the wake of the Civil War did the United States begin to implement the racial equality that the Amistad case had seemed to promise. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution banned slavery. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection of the laws. And the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. More than a century and a half after their liberation, Sin Kei and the Amistad captives remain a powerful symbol. In the past few years, they have been represented in plays, a cantata, and a best-selling novel. On the 150th anniversary of the Amistad captives' liberation, a new Amistad committee composed of New Haven, Connecticut citizens, unveiled a bronze sculpture to commemorate the Amistad captives. Just before Cinque and the Africans sailed back to Sierra Leone, one of their supporters paid them a visit. Realizing that their story would be remembered long into the future, he wrote to the newspaper, The Colored American, Please record the names of Sinke and his comrades, that they may be a matter of history to hand down to posterity. Their names were Grabo, Kimbo, Konoma, Verna, Kwatu, Gnagwa, Kwang, Fulewa, Bia, Pungwe, Sesi, Moru, and Dama, Fury, Bao, Ba, Shule, Kale, Banga, Sa, Kina, 
and gone honey, fang, fagina, yaboy, febana, shukama, berry, foon, berna, shuma, kauli, teme, kagni, magu, Sin K. Yeah. 